Ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to New Hope in the Lord. I'm Reverend Joseph, your host. Uh, thank you for watching our broadcast today. Rosa Owens, my co-host, is, is not with us. Where are you today? Well, I know where you are watching this program. But where are you today in your heart? Do you have faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ? Or you don't? That's the bottom line. Because receiving Christ in your life is the only way your sins will be forgiven and you have eternal life. You live forever. Nobody knows what forever is because everything here on earth comes to an end, ladies and gentlemen. You might be an individual that you were walking with God and now you've gone astray, which I read on the internet this morning. This fellow was saying, I have to get back to God said, I used to have a wonderful relationship with the Lord. I used to feel happy. Life was worth living. I used to have his joy. But I allowed myself to have the demons, which are real. The unseen world is, is more real than the seen world. Brought me back into drugs. And for weeks now, I've been hooked on drugs. And this is what he said that was key. I have a black hole in my life. I need to come back to God. I need to have Jesus again rule in my life. And ladies and gentlemen, you might be that way. You might not have gone away from God because of drugs, but you might have gone away from uh, the Lord for other reasons or whatnot. Jesus loves you. He died for your sins, and he wants to draw you back to himself because he's the only answer. And you know in your heart, and your mind, there is a black hole that's there. And he wants to take that black hole out and fill you with that love, joy, peace, and that happiness from within that you used to have. Trust the Lord. Repent. And ask the Holy Spirit to come back in and change your heart and your life. Now, our, our guest today, Eli, Eli Sotomayor, is, is different. Uh, he didn't go through a situation where many uh, preachers' kids, they call them PK, which is preacher kids. There's a lot of pressure on them, and a lot of them uh, grow up astray from God. But, but Eli didn't. He did the straight and narrow line uh, till today. And he's probably, I know, so happy because he did through the many trials and tribulations that you have to go through, especially when you have Christ in your life. Eli, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. Thank you for having me. And uh, coming here. So as a preacher's kid, um, it's not easy. Not at all. Why don't you just tell us about growing up in a family where your father was uh, the preacher, but yet he was your father. Well, my dad was a... a a chef, a seafood chef. Uh, Roma in the house always was amazing. Uh, we didn't know we had it so good food-wise, but he was also a minister in the gospel. And uh, there was a, a weight upon us as kids, as four of us. I have two, uh, a younger brother, an older brother, and an elder sister. And uh, the pressures on us to perform, the criticism that came from the members of the church mm. and the complaints that came from my mom and my mom would share the complaints with my dad and my dad would lose it and we would get the spanking. The sparing of the rod was not existing in our home. There was a lot of rod <laughs> administered, but you know, it kept me straight. Uh, my older brother uh, did not fare so well. Uh, his life, you know, pretty much went south. Today, thank God that he's back. And uh, my younger brother, uh, also my sister, you know, still seeking. Uh, but, you know, there, there, there is a, a quiet pressure that, that I try to answer within myself as I grew up and try to figure things out, and I didn't have the answers. And, and, and the thing that's so uh, distasteful uh, is that church members, uh, people in the church yeah. uh, who don't have that deep relationship with Jesus— uh, they have a surface relationship or might not have a relationship, Eli. They look at a preacher's kid as they have to be perfect. That's right. They have to dot every I and cross every T.
but there was only one that was perfect, and his name is Jesus. That's right. And, and you know, it's like this, you, know, you point two fingers and three come back. And so you grew up in a, in a household that was um, different uh, yes. than uh, other households. And um, you, you must have had some frustration from within your heart and which could kind of build up anger. Um, d did you have that in school? Uh, while you were growing up, uh, were you were you bullied at all? Because it, it, there is a lot of bullying. It didn't happen just uh, f five years ago. It's been for a long time. Yeah, the bullying went on. They, uh, in school, they would mop the hallways with my little body. I was uh, uh, hmm. very tiny and scrawny. Uh, only until I hit the eleventh grade did I shoot up to almost six feet. But I was like uh, like four foot something, real small. And all my friends around me would grow, and uh, I lived in fear. Lived in fear in the school because I was very small and I was uh, abused by other physically punching. Uh, they used me as a punching bag, and uh, and that uh, totally uh, any any hopes of becoming something w were diminished just by the amount of beatings. And I kind of went through this quiet depression, and I wouldn't share with anybody. Uh, I didn't have the ability uh, to c uh, communicate. I was like an introvert. So 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 basically, your parents had no idea. No. And uh, it must have affected your, your work in school, maybe, and, and at home also? Well, I, ha I had major learning disabilities. Uh, the biggest cause was mostly uh, nutrition, malnutrition, hmm. uh, which I now I understand why. But between the malnutrition, the bullying, uh, the constant non-sparing of the rod at the house, uh, you get to a point that you just go into this shell and you just can't come out. I I'm amazed that you didn't go get into the world that even uh, in your school, uh, at your age, the drugs and the alcohol and the promiscuity, uh, I'm just amazed that with all the, the pressure that Satan put on you through individuals, that you did stay the straight and narrow course as far as not getting out into the world. And, right. and what, do you, what do you attribute that to? Well, uh, um, I have a comical side. <clears throat> And uh, comic relief was one of them, and the other one is music. Okay. I just uh, dove into music, and I, I stood there. Uh, I had a little uh, accordion when I was a child, and I just learned every tune until I, I literally that sent that accordion to its, to its gravesite. And uh, <laughs> later on, picked up the little plastic guitar with plastic strings until my sister jumped into the closet where the uh, guitar was at and she all I heard was crunch and I cried for days. Oh, we were wow. we were you know grew up very poor so you know a little yeah. plastic guitar was a big deal back then. Mm. So so basically um, where a lot of these uh, young children go into the things of the world you you, you took it and music and uh, music uh, that was at a young age was God preparing you even though you didn't know it, maybe for the future. Right. And Absolutely. So, what happened after you after, after you got out of school? Um, <clears throat> um, w did you still have that kind of rejection and the insecurity and the oh, fear? Oh yeah. It lasted until I got married. And, and, how, and even how, even after, it took years mm. to kind of you know get that off of me. Mm. Did, did did you ever have um, other other people around you, like other uh, believers around you? Um, kind of have that same type of attitude and situation happen to them that you might have known? Like, you, did you have somebody that you talked to maybe and could have said, geez, uh, uh, I know what you're going through? No. Or you just didn't say to anybody? You just I did not. I was not a good communicator. I, uh, like I said, mostly an introvert. I did not know how to speak because I was not allowed to speak in the house. Mm. So we never develop a... Uh, uh, any ability to communicate and share what we call—I didn't even know what the word mm. "share" meant till I became older. I had no con no concept of what that. So, word so was. if you're an introvert <clears throat> and 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 uh, it's horrible uh, with rejection and fear, Satan has you gripped. That's right. For total defeat, and uh, how how did that start to uh, kind of dissipate uh, in your life? Um, how it started to go away was. Uh, when I got deep into music, I later on became a, a live sound engineer. And I went on the road, and this opened up my eyes to what the world has to offer and what it doesn't have to offer. And I had to become a communicator because uh, being a, the chief sound engineer on these events, 
I had to communicate in sometimes in English and sometimes many times in Spanish and different forms of Spanish, especially when you travel throughout uh, Central and South America. Mm. And then I became to become a little bit more loose and fluid in communication on the technical. Still a little shy on the personal, but later mm. on that developed. Now, did, did you date uh, as an introvert? Because uh, I know you said that uh, it really started to get lessened after you, you got married. Right. Uh, how did you as an introvert like that, not talking to people, communicating, how did it work out with you to, to, to date your wife and to, to, well, to get Well, I dated married? my wife for three years. Uh, we've been together now 41, so 38 years married. It's been a, a great marriage. And she's been a good part of my success. Um, problem was that she was also very quiet. Mm. And so me communicating, how was your day? She would go, good. Okay. Have any more? That's just the other way. <laughs> yeah. uh, the woman would tell you from A to Z. Yeah. Uh, the no, man is. Uh, oh, how was your How was your day? The The wife said right. uh, it was great. Uh, what did you do? Uh, I had worked. To keep, <laughs> right. But but so basically, <clears throat> both of you were kind of on the shy side. So God kind of they say opposites attract, but in this case, oh. it wasn't. Opposites. Yeah. It, it took a while insane. and eventually, you know, uh, I was able to develop uh, the ability to teach her to open up in conversation. Mm. And uh, today we, we chat quite a bit, which is great. So, so God worked first in your life yeah. there. And, and what happened now after uh, this shyness and this uh, inability to communicate? Uh, because as a believer, uh, we are commanded actually uh, by the Lord to go out into all the world and preach the gospel. Right. And w when we're introverted, we can't do it or we can't speak because Moses uh, had five excuses why he can't go. One of them was, ah, da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. I stutter. <laughs> and the Lord said, well, you got your brother Aaron with you. And, and Jeremiah said, uh, I can't, I can't, uh, I'm too young. And the Lord said, uh, open up your mouth, I'll put the words in. So. Uh, did you eventually start to get to that place where you were relaxed and be able to share uh, your faith? Oh yeah, yeah. I, I was I was able actually to minister on the road, which was the most amazing thing. Um, and I I didn't know that I was being a light in the darkness because the mm. uh, the acts that I traveled with were uh, not Christian acts. Uh, the only one act that I traveled for five years was with R. W. Schambach. Uh and but be throughout I was touring with many bands. And I do recall that sometimes you don't know that you're being a witness. And we went uh, on our way back from uh, Bogota, Colombia on a 747. And after we board the plane, <coughs> they announced that we have to deboard, get off the plane. Three mm -hmm. hours off, they bring the dog. Someone had called in a bomb scare. Oh. So we had to get off the plane. And guess what? They bring us back on the same plane. They said it's clean. I said, okay, this is a pretty big jet to clear in three hours. Mm -hmm. So uh, right before we take off, I fasten my seatbelt, I bow my head down, and I start to pray. And from all over the plane, they say, Eli, you got me covered, Eli, you got me covered, bro, you got me covered. And I'm like, oh, wow, you just don't know who you're witnessing to mm. when you're on the road. Yes. And the rigors of the road are very, uh, very vicious because anything that you want is at your disposal. I mean, it, I travel with a Class A act, and, uh, and you, you know, you, you become like this to go-to guy that has all the answers. But I never thought that I was being a light in that darkness mm. until that day. And I said, you see, they're watching you. They're mm. watching you. And I said, well, that's why I got to walk that narrow. It's not easy to walk that narrow road in mm. all aspects, with nutrition, with your choices, the, your words. And everyone had a filthy, lang uh, filthy mouth and their language was uh, you know, uh, in the gutter all the time. And I could never reply at that level. And that's when even... The, uh, the main artist would always say, it says, it says, be careful how you talk around Eli. You know, he's mm. a Christian, you know. It's like, wow, even, mm. you know, and I, that was the, uh, the staple throughout, you know, my, my years on the road. So somebody once said, uh, you might be the only Bible that somebody reads. That's right. And uh, it, 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 it has to be pressure yeah. because uh, the enemy is, is behind all of the things that, uh, that are not right and the Lord's behind all of the things that are right and so there's actually two forces in our bodies good 
through the Lord and evil through the flesh and the enemy. Right. But did, did, did you have anybody now, because you're on the road, you're, you're um, extroverted now, did you have anybody back home? Uh, I know your wife was praying, but did you have people praying for you? Yeah, well, my mom, she's always been a prayer, you know, a warrior. Uh, every time I call us, you know, I'm praying for you, right? I pray mm. for you all the time. I said, thank you, mom. I pray for mm. you too. Um, other than that, um, I, I, not unless other people were covering me in, in private, but pretty much just my wife and my mom. Mm. Um, you know, it's, it's just you get to a point where people think that you are the Superman mm. and you don't need support from elsewhere. And mm. like we have to hold our pastors, you know, who have the bullseye on their foreheads, you know, we have to hold them up in prayer because yes. they're the first person that, that can fall. You get the head, then you get the yeah, tail. that's exactly right. So, so why don't you share uh, maybe one or maybe you have a couple uh, stories. Uh, I have about a million and one. You pick yeah. from one to a million. Well, uh, talk, talk about uh, some of the things that, that were uh, really in tough situations where, where God just kind of, you know it was God that intervened. Well, that would be uh, my uh, heart attack event back in 2011, July 16, 2011. I remember the day. I remember the time. It was like 1 o'clock in the morning. Mm. Uh, I got this. I uh, was feeling really weird in bed, and I thought it was I was having a dream. I'm in the middle of a heart attack. Uh, my wife is a pretty heavy sleeper. I was able to make it to the bathroom. When I looked in the mirror, I saw a pale ghost. And I said, oh, my goodness, this doesn't look good. And I felt like I had an elephant step on my chest. Mm. And I felt like I had swallowed a bale of cotton. Wow. I said, this is not good. I must be in the middle of something. But I couldn't figure it out because I was so confused. The blood pressure was almost non-existent. <clears throat> mm. I'm able to uh, get to back to the bedroom. And I'm trying to call my wife. And I'm telling her, Mari, wake up. She won't wake up. Finally get one last yell, Mari, wake up. Mm. And she goes, what? You know, of mm. course, she's, you know, sleeping. Like, sure. yeah, she's sleeping. She says, I think I'm having a heart attack. I said, I think I'm having a heart attack. Of course, jump in the car. We didn't call the ambulance, jumped in the car. She drove me to Einstein and went to Einstein. I jumped out of the car, almost fell on the floor, and I collapsed on the front counter. And I'm like this, laying over the counter and asked me, oh, sir, what's your name? Uh, do you have insurance? Yeah, yeah, right. I'm, I'm having a heart attack. <laughs> yeah, uh, excuse me, what's your name again? Yeah. Heart attack. Uh, yeah. So they put the cuff on me, sat me down. So, oh, my good. They put me in the gurney, sent me in right away. And then they uh, did the uh, angioplasty, shoved the wire into my heart, and it felt like Pac-Man. Mm. And as I lay there on that, uh, on that steel uh, table, the first time ever in an operating room, and I just said, Lord, don't let me die here. Mm. And I said, if I do, he said, I pray for my forgiveness of all my sins. Mm. And uh, got past that point. They broke, put me on uh, life support for three days. I'm in a private room. Uh, on that day, my guests had left. They were visiting me. And I hear a voice that tells me, you need to leave. And I'm like. Nobody's around. Nobody's around. Mm -hmm. And I'm, uh, of course, I'm on a morphine drip. So I'm thinking, OK, I'm hallucinating. The morphine drip is doing its job. Mm -hmm. I'm hearing things. Mm -hmm. And I'm there relaxing again. I said, you need to leave. And I'm like. Okay, that was too audible. Mm. Okay. Just dismissed it, left it alone, went throughout the night. The following day, they had already removed the uh, life support, and I was functioning on my own. And I hear the voice again, I told you, you need to leave or the results are not going to be good. Mm. I'll be, oh, okay, I think I know where that's coming. That's got to be God talking to me to get up. But how do I get up and get out of here? Yes. This is going to be a, a tough thing to do. Yeah. Uh, I have no knowledge in nutrition. I was eating whatever, you know, just like everyone else. You go to the store, you see something, you like it, it tastes sweet, you take it down. So um, I asked the nurses, you know, what do I have to do to get out of this hospital bed? She says, you can't get out of here. You're getting your quadruple uh, bypass surgery tomorrow morning. You're scheduled for surgery. She says, no, no, no. How do I get out of here? You know, and she says, uh, hold on a minute. You've got to fill out a lot of paperwork. I said, well, get me the paperwork. She returns back and about 10 doctors flood my uh, room to convince me to stay <coughs> and why I shouldn't leave because I'm going to have a heart attack and I'm going to die. Uh, I said, wow. I said, that's not good. I told her, he said, just get me the paperwork. Already they had told me, they had sat me down, they had given me, uh, because I was about 85% clogged up and down on my arterial system, they said I would only live one year and if I had the open 
bypass surgery maybe five years because they didn't, they didn't think I was going to survive. Uh, I was so clogged internally that I, I didn't even qualify for stents. They couldn't mm -hmm. apply any stents. So finally, they, uh, they come with a big paper and it says AMA in big red letters. And I asked her, what does that mean? She says, against medical advice, that you're leaving against medical advice. Usually they roll you to the door in a wheelchair because I was up on the second floor in the uh, uh, heart ward. And I had to walk down the hallway by myself. So I still had all the EKG leads on. I was in the little gown that they give you. I had the oxygen mask on, I took that off, disconnected the EKG leads, got dressed, started walking down the hallway. Now, this is the first time that I've walked in four days because mm. I was strapped to the bed. I was bedridden, mm. I couldn't do anything. Uh, and I start walking on my own, just trusting that that was the word of God that had spoken to me. Mm. As I'm walking down the hallway, the entire hospital started to spin. Wow. And the voice comes to a little voice wow. and I say, you better get back into that hospital bed and get you open up, bypass your, heart, your surgery. And I'm like, oh my God, yeah, I don't feel so good. I better go back to bed. And if a little angel shows up and says, no, no, I gave you strict instructions. You got to go. And then these two go at it. And I'm like, I'm thinking I'm losing my mind hearing these uh, positive and a, and a negative and a positive voice coming at me. And I say, you know what? I'm going to follow. I've been a Christian all my life. I believe I have faith. And I got, I, I got, to the point where I, I made it all the way to where they, uh, my guests were waiting to come in to see me, and I went to see them. And I'm like, well, what are you doing here? I says, well, I got instructions to go. From where? From above. Mm. Made it home. Took me about a half an hour to climb 13 steps to the top of my apartment. Wow. And, and, and I, that's it. At that time, again, doubt kept visiting me over and over and over again. Never stopped. And so, long story short, that seven years four months ago to date, and I thank God that uh, I am here. I changed my entire way of living. It's a lifestyle. I changed what I eat. Uh, I try to reduce my stress factor. That's big. And uh, I created a bunch of uh, uh, homeopathic protocols or biohacks, if you want to call it that, to not have to take any medication. So in seven years, four months to date, I have, never, have not been sick, mm. take no medication, Everything's all natural, basically mostly foods and water. When, when, when you first got home, um, I'm sure, I am sure, there must have been some people in your household uh, that were not pleased with you. Oh, yeah. yeah and and were, they, were they badgering you? At the hospital, when I told, when I declared it to my wife that I wasn't going to get the open heart surgery, my wife, my daughter, and my mother. I felt like Job <laughs> when they told him to curse your God and die. And they told me, no, you got to get it. And they were like, literally, yeah. I said, how could you possibly be screaming at me at the top of your lungs? You know that I am the patient. And I just went through a major heart attack. And sure enough, man, uh, uh, it took, I think, seven months before God actually spoke to my wife and told him that that heart attack and the whole move, the departure from the hospital was ordained by him. How long were you uh, home before you could actually, you know, get out and function? A week. Uh, just a week. A week. I changed my, uh, what I did is immediately because I found out what was the cause. I, it was the sugars. I, I, for many years, I had undiagnosed diabetes. I had undiagnosed pernicious anemia, B12 deficiency. And I started to Google all the things that I could do. I found a lot of bad information, a lot of great information. I seen I'm going to try them all. Mm. I purchased a bunch of books, and I was reading about 12 hours a day just to avoid going to the grave. Mm. And what I, first thing that I did is I reduced all my sugars and all the grains, removed any, any uh, simple carbs out, water and lemon all the way. Then I introduced some apple cider vinegar, some baking soda, some cayenne pepper, and all of a sudden I developed up some protocols that actually work and have kept me from visiting. I haven't been, I, this is kind of crazy, but I haven't been back to the doctor in seven years and three months. Mm. I, and, and the thing is, is that when you hear the voice of God and you, you know it's the voice go. of God, you have to do it. Yeah. And, and as I said earlier, we have the, the natural man mm -hmm. and we have the spiritual man. And we have the spiritual man who's led by the Holy Spirit. And then we have the spiritual uh, enemy that comes in and says, get back into the hospital it. bed. Get, so, it's a, so it's basically a war going on. Oh, yeah. And, and so since that time, uh, 
what, what, what have you been doing, uh, Eli, as far as your work now uh, situation? You, are you continuing in your music? Yeah, I, I still do my trucking. I still do my live shows. Uh, I do uh, workshops, uh, a lot of training. Uh, I've become a consultant for audiovisual, uh, and that keeps me busy. Uh, in the meantime, I was able to re uh, buy a small farm out in Florida and started my little organic farm out there. Mm. And uh, um, bringing a dream to life. Mm. When Satan had you bound, uh, but Jesus set you free. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the binding up is from within, the introverts, oh, yeah. the, the fear, the rejection. Uh, those things have caused many people to commit suicide. Right. Uh, j just in a, about a minute or so, uh, would you look into this camera, uh, Eli, and speak uh, to the audience there? Right in that camera. What do you want me to tell them? Just tell them what's on your heart. Well, I'm going to give you guys one tip. Those are, that are l listening to what I'm saying, uh, I had a career that was going to literally die because of poor nutrition, malabsorption, malnutrition. Uh, next time that you consume something, Think about what you're putting into your mouth. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. It's a stewardship. You have been ordered to take care of it. And it is my you know, duty to share with you what I did. Not that something you, you may have a different way of doing things, but I'm telling you, just by reducing simply your grains and your sugars, you can see a huge health increase in your life getting off the sodas you know, uh, I listened to God, and he told me what to Google. It's an amazing thing. He puts a thought in my mind. I Google it, and then I reverse Google it, and I go to different multiple search engines to find the truth And because I just couldn't get it from the doctors. Not that they don't provide a great service for an emergency, but when you have food-induced intoxication and you're going to die because of what you're eating, think twice of that next sugary drink. Think twice of that next sandwich. If you're having bagels and cookies, everything for breakfast, lunch, you're having a sub, and for dinner, you're having more carbs. Eventually, your arterial highway is going to clog, and, and the change, the uh, results are not going to be good. Thank you, Eli, for Absolutely. your Thank testimony you for of God's grace and how God's changed your life. Amen. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, testimonies are what it's all about. Reality show is what this is, a reality of Jesus Christ, who's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus changed Eli, Amen. he could change you. Jesus, say, Jesus saved Eli when he was just a little boy, he could save you. Ask Christ into your life. Thank you for watching our broadcast today.